Portugal is a past in search of a future. One of Europe's oldest nation states, the country has entered a new era in her almost thousand year history. In 1974, young soldiers overthrew the 48 year old dictatorship and set the stage for a transition to a democracy. A great deal has happened in Portugal since the 25th of April, 1974, but the past is ever present. The current situation is, as usual, incalculable. The future? To understand Portugal and her people today, we must begin with the sea, with their ancient maritime tradition, geographical location, and superb natural harbor at Lisbon, the capital, the Portuguese began an imperial cycle. By 1520, Portugal was the first state to have imperial possessions on the Atlantic islands and the coasts of Africa, Asia, and the Americas. Portugal was a first-class world power. But by the 19th century, Portugal was Western Europe's weakest and poorest nation. The Braganza monarchy was replaced in 1910 with the First Republic, Europe's most unstable parliamentary regime. In 1926, conservative soldiers established the New State, the West's longest surviving authoritarian regime. Leftist soldiers toppled this dictatorship in 1974 in a bloodless military coup. Portugal's imperial cycle was ended. After 13 years of fighting, independence was granted to all of her African colonies and to Timor in Indonesia. Macau, the South China island, retained nominal Portuguese rule. Portugal had lost her empire, but had gained a new form of government, a democracy, a second republic. Francisco Balsemao is the editor-publisher of the weekly Lisbon newspaper Expresso and a leader of the Social Democrat Party, the PSD. As you know, we had to submit all, every, anything we wanted to publish to the census through proofs like this. And they could cut to one part, everything. They could say, OK, and they could say, wait. And there were no blank spaces authorized in the newspaper. So we had to wait, or at the last moment, to change everything. It was a hard time, and we were especially punished by the census at that time. After the 25th of April, I must tell you that although at a certain time we were practically the only national newspaper, uh, being a weekly, but even among dailies, that was not with the official communist line at that time, I must tell you that I had never had real difficult problems in what concerns press freedom after the revolution. We had threats, of course, we had anonymous calls, we had people, uh, people saying that they were coming to invade us. We spent, I spent some nights here at the same desk with a pistol in my hands waiting for the invaders, but they didn't come. In the period between April 25th, 1974 and November 25th, 1975, Portugal experienced an extraordinary revolution of the left. The release of frustration and the new freedoms resulted in Portugal's worst economic crisis since the 1920s. There were radical takeovers of housing, farms, and factories. Riots occurred, and there was some bloodshed. In two years, there were thousands of strikes, six provisional governments, 60 political parties, three general elections, and a number of coup attempts. In 1976, a new constitution proclaimed that the Second Republic was on the road to a classless society, a socialist paradise. It was not enough for the Portuguese armed forces movement to master the tired defenders of the old order. They also had to master themselves and their people. Most of those people knew nothing of revolutionary socialism. Many did not know the meaning of the hammer and sickles scrawled on town walls. In November 1975, moderate soldiers ended the radicals' control and turned over power to civilians. By mid-1976, Portugal had founded a democracy, a multi-party system with a free press, free courts, free elections, an elected president of the republic, a premier, a one-chamber legislature, and a progressive constitution. Our economic situation is bad. Of course, it's bad all over the world, especially in the Western world. But I wouldn't mind changing most of our problems with any 
Western country at this moment. Our problems are much worse. Uh, this is due to the international crisis and to the poverty of Portugal. It's also due to the in uncertainty of the last three years, which in a way is natural. We cannot expect to have a revolution and the next day everything to start functioning very well. Uh, we have, on historical terms, it's understandable. But on practical day-to-day -day terms, it's more difficult for people to accept it. And if the economic problems are not solved, I would say immediately, but in the short time, uh, we risk uh, having people against democracy. People saying, oh no, we don't want democracy anymore because the, before it was better. That's the big risk, and people like me who have fought, fought uh, against the previous situation do not want it. That is the main problem. The problems of the new Portugal come in new forms, but tradition is pervasive. The economic problem must be solved or democracy cannot survive. But the economic problem is only part of a larger truth, that the Portuguese people are still, as in the past, living in a poor country. All resources are scarce, including housing, land for farming and building. The educational system is poorly organized and mass transit is inadequate. And there is simply not enough space for all the cars now driving the streets of Lisbon. In the Atlantic Ocean, space is limited for fisheries and the fishing industry. Among the scarcest of resources is food. In 1977, over half of Portugal's food had to be imported. Between 1974 and 1977, prices doubled and in some cases tripled. While Madeira Island and parts of Portugal might well produce enough bananas for domestic needs, bananas on sale in Lisbon's wharf markets are imported from Ecuador. Okay. This young peddler of bananas in a Lisbon wharfside market tells the story of how she worked 10 years in a factory. Come the revolution, the factory collapsed and she lost her job. To survive, she is selling bananas from Ecuador and votes for the PCP, the Portuguese Communist Party. Many salaries have doubled, but food prices have exceeded the increase. Unemployment reached 20% within a few years of the 1974 coup. In 1975, thousands of colonial refugees began to flee the former colonies in Africa and Asia. The returned ones, as they are known to the people, the homeless ones to the government. They presented Portugal with massive problems. How many there are of them, no one knows. In 1977, 450,000 were officially registered with the government, but thousands more sought refuge in Africa, Brazil, and the United States. Estimates of their number living in Portugal ranged from 700,000 to 1 million. In a country with only 9 million people, this refugee problem ranks as a world record. These refugees are varied in age and in race. There are black Africans, Afro-Europeans, Europeans, Indians, Pakistanis, Goanese, Cape Verdeans, and Timorese. Perhaps only a little more than half are white Portuguese, and the number of children is large. Some are not Portuguese citizens. These returned ones are from Angola and have been living for two years in a hotel in Estoril. Many are bitter. Their complaints concentrated on criticism of how the government spends money to help them, how they've been cheated, how funds spent on hotel meals and rooms could have been better spent on getting them food they liked and jobs they needed. Some have lived in airport lounges with no place to go. The refugees have complicated the struggle. The old and new Portuguese struggle for scarce resources, for survival, for influence, for dignity, and self-respect. The problems of food, prices, inflation, unemployment are related to the land, to the agrarian problem, to farming. there is a historic division of Portuguese land holding. North of the Tagus River, most holdings are very small. Many only an acre or two. 
South of the Tagus, in the extensive Alenteju province, are the large holdings, or latifundia. After the 1974 coup, Alenteju workers moved to make up for lost centuries. They forcibly expropriated and occupied 2.5 million acres, and cooperatives were established. The socialist government of Premier Mario Suarez modified the land takeovers, but the agrarian problem remains a most impassioned issue. The Alentejo province is one of the strongholds of the PCP, the Portuguese Communist Party. The Alentejo, as with most things, reflects contrasts and contradictions, tradition and change, the old and the new. Within the same farm in the Alentejo, workers use handmade hoes of ancient design to irrigate rough corn for cattle plots. While down the road, a new harvester cuts away in a different age. Scarce resources, agrarian problems. The potential of this sunny land remains unrealized. The products which Portugal ships to the world are valuable and are much sought after. Production could be improved with better organization, more capital, and new skills. Highly valued in markets which know their quality are Portuguese cork, olives, wheat, wines from fine vineyards, citrus fruits, and tomato paste. Portugal, however, is struggling to feed and support itself. Tradition persists in other areas of the economy. Redevelopment of these industries could provide the new Portugal with jobs and foreign exports which would reduce the country's serious trade deficits. Like other areas, traditional handicrafts and arts have potential for future development. Portugal's artisans and craftsmen have maintained the ancient traditions in copperware, pewter, glass, and ceramics. Craftsmen have preserved fine skills and old patterns. In the town of Malvera, 30 miles north of Lisbon, the ceramic factory of Lopez o Marques was established a few years ago. Although new, Senhor Marques factory is known throughout the world for its fine ceramics. Marques maintains the high standards of the old craftsman. His artisans paint by hand and work for about 6,000 escudos, or about $169 a month. This young apprentice, who comes from a family of 12, is only 15 years old. She earns $95 a month. Another form of preserved craftsmanship is the reproduction of the traditional Portuguese blue and white tiles, or azulejo. Many factories with hand-painting artists reproduce tiles to order and ship them all over the world. The full potential of this newly cultivated export is just being discovered. As Portugal slowly industrializes, her material resources await greater development. Her more tangible resources also require stewardship. Despite a low profile, Catholic schools, a Catholic university, Catholic churches, and their welfare organizations are very active. Roman Catholicism remains a significant factor in Portuguese life. The thousands of historic church buildings are a precious legacy of the past rare resources for the people, and wonders for millions of tourists.
Portuguese cultivate and utilize these special resources. Here are among Europe's finest and cleanest beaches and many excellent hotels. Among Europeans, Portugal remains a popular tourist place. The Portuguese bullfight, where pageantry, horsemanship, and bull jumping predominate. European soccer, or football, is the national sport. Here in the city of Setubal, Portuguese youth play a practice game of a variation of soccer known as court football. Fado, a word which means fate or fortune, is a national music tradition songs from a proud heritage sung by men and women. Two instruments accompany the fado singer, the steel guitar and the mandolin. The styles of dress and beliefs of fado singers may change, but the act of fado singing is time resistant. Like Fado, the Lisbon Musical Review remains a popular form of entertainment for all. The review in Codfish Waters was very popular in Lisbon in 1977. To Americans, the review's format resembles a blend of vaudeville, nightclub review, and variety show, consisting of skits, dances, songs, and pageantry. Portugal's political culture is rich and intricate. The sardonic political satire spares no one, least of all governments in office. Like other reviews, this one reflected changing political opinion, a shift from the fashionable left to greater dissatisfaction with the economic crisis, a desire for renewed authority for law and order. The spoofing of the mannerisms of the President of the Republic, General Ramelho Yanis, part of the review earlier in the year, had been cut out by the summer of 1977. The target of biting satire here is a didactic and diminutive minister of education who is attempting to untangle the ongoing crisis in the schools and universities. <laughs> the status of women in Portugal is part of the story of a new democracy, changing attitudes and scarce resources. Portuguese women live in what remains a male-dominated world. The government cannot change traditional attitudes, but it has made a beginning. The first constitutional government of socialist premier Mario Suarez sympathized with the plight of women and attempted to improve their status. It also recognized facts. 28% of the workforce are women. 54% of the electorate are women. Any party which wishes to win a fair proportion of the votes must count on women voters. The first constitutional government of Suarez created the Commission on the Status of Women, a government department attached to the Premier's office. One of the Commission's goals is to encourage, quote, a change of attitudes of both men and women so that every person may achieve full human dignity, unquote. Anna Vicente is a technical consultant to the Commission. We have a new constitution uh, the Constitution of April 2, 1976, has changed the status of Portuguese women because um, women are defined in a completely different way to formally. Women and men have the same social dignity and equal rights, and maternity is considered to be of profound social importance. Now, uh, this means that all uh, laws that uh, do not agree with the Constitution uh, have to be changed and uh, this is meant that family law that we have a new family law which has abolished discrimination against women 
Uh, other things that have changed uh, since April uh, 25th is we now have a divorce law for marriages that take place uh, in church and also um, free family planning centers are being set up all over the country. In other ways too, attitudes are a vital part of Portugal's struggle for a just, humane society while building a modern people. Reconstructing an economy and keeping a new democracy are formidable tasks. In Portuguese tradition, authoritarian rule has prevailed over democratic government. Rule by men has dominated the rule of law. Democracy's survival here may depend as much on public attitudes and political behavior as on economic recovery. For a lot of time, almost more than 40 years, 50 years almost, we had no political life. And we had the right wing, uh, non-democratic, having power and controlling things. Now, from, from in the last three years, we have more or less the left controlling. Uh, the new political class has not yet had time to, to show what it's worth. Anyway, personally, I believe that uh, there is too much personalism and there is too much uh, uh, tendency to see political parties as you see um, football clubs. Uh, I mean by that, that uh, men like uh, Mr. Suarez or Mr. Sacarneiro are more than charismatic leaders. They are a bit like the football, like the football stars in a way, seen by people as that, although personally they are not. And that is uh, bad for political life because it does not give to the people the true dimension of problems and it personalizes too much all matters that are being discussed. Socialist leader Mario Suarez, in an interview, agreed with the famous essayist educator Antonio Sergio that, quote, the Portuguese problem is a problem of mentality and of education and training, unquote. The revolution must begin in minds and there must be a reform of the Portuguese mentality to give rise to a more critical sense and to combat a tendency to emotional feelings rather than the rational. Mario Suarez suggested that building a democratic spirit is a long-range program which involves self-government and self-discipline. Also necessary for a more secure future is the re-establishment of a certain amount of order in the schools and universities. The presidentialism or the semi-presidentialism you were mentioning could be a way of solving this problem within the constitution and therefore with democracy. The other solution is that the political parties not being so personalized and trying to be more objective in their approach of to problems could get together and through a, what I call and what we call a democratic stable majority, stable democratic majority, would try to solve together the major issues, issues which are, of course, economic, but have social and therefore political consequences. I think there are risks and we cannot have the very simplifying vision that, vision that many people abroad have of saying Portugal has an elec elected president of the republic, elected uh, parliament, a government resulting from the popular will, therefore everything is okay in Portugal. That's a very sim too oversimplifying approach and a simplistic approach and that is not the truth. We have problems inside. We are still suffering the consequences of what has happened before. We lost an empire or an, a, and made a decolonization which is contested by many people. And therefore, the uh, instability of all this can uh, have effects in the future of democracy. Let's hope it won't have. Portugal remains a beautiful but poor country. The struggle continues for scarce resources, for space, for security, in a country which cannot provide sufficient food or jobs for her people. A land of contrasts, Portugal has modern elements alongside the ancient. Outside growing Lisbon, with newer problems like traffic, pollution, crime, and drug abuse, the countryside has older problems of poverty and illiteracy. <laughs> Nationalism is strong, yet some question Portugal's future as a nation. Cultural homogeneity is intense, but the infusion of refugees from Africa has brought in new multiracial elements to a white society.
In this century, on four previous occasions, the Portuguese have rejected political systems which were not solving the nation's key problems. In 1910, in 1926, in 1974, and again in late 1975. Portugal's young democracy has taken its first steps. The people remain largely practical, conservative, and hardworking. As a haven for tourists, Portugal enjoys continuing appeal. Portugal's location as a crossroads between the West and Africa, its maritime and engineering skills, and its superb ports offer great opportunities. The 16th century Portuguese poet, Luís de Camões, wrote that Portugal in his day gave new worlds to the world. In the last quarter of the 20th century, without an empire, with new leaders and new generations, Portugal must discover her own new internal world, which is suited to its tomorrow. This old country must redefine its own individuality, shape its new mission. A long-suffering people struggle. New poets dream. Politicians talk. In sunbound barracks, soldiers wait. Portugal, a past in search of a future. Agora muita cautela, não vou me dar por Deus. Canoa, conheces bem, quando há norte pela proa, quantas docas sem Lisboa. E as muralhas que ela tem Canoa Por onde vais Se algum barco te avalgoa Nunca mais voltas ao cais Nunca, nunca, nunca mais Canoa, por onde vais? Se algum barco te avalua, nunca mais voltas ao cais, nunca, nunca, nunca mais.